Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking Iran, Shmuel and Iran, for really putting together a great conference that I hope not to spoil in the last minute. And I want to thank Jay for actually devoting time and working on geophysical problems in his, the last 20 years or so, and making important contributions to various topics ranging from generation of roughness and branching on faults to developing <coughs> bridges between fracture and, fracture and friction, and also demonstrating that uh, on interfaces, before you get microscopic, up, with students, of course, and we heard fabulous uh, talks by the students. So before you get microscopic rupture, there is a whole set of weak rupture fronts that must play a role in preparing the surface for the microscopic rupture. And that is, gives us some sort of potential maybe to look at the precursory deformation and also the works on bimaterial ruptures that we heard Yochai, uh, 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 actually Hadar, and then asymmetry of geometry from Yochai. So I will try to test predictions of theoretical prediction of bimaterial rupture using data in the field. And I selected the San Jacinto Fault Zone in Southern California because Jay knows that fault very well. And for those of you that don't know the San Jacinto, the San Jacinto is the most seismic, seismically active part of the San Andreas system in Southern California. This, this whole collection of faults is the San Andreas system. The San Andreas proper is here. This is the San Jacinto. All the dots with different colors are seismicity, epicenters. Different colors just to denote different things that are not important here. And in a Google map, and you all discovered probably that you could see things better on the side screens, the San Jacinto is right here, this big crack. <coughs> now, there is a particular place right here. It's called the Typhocation area that, in fact, is a hot spot in the San Jacinto itself. And that's a canyon. Uh, and the next uh, slide shows a group of scientists uh, preparing themselves for a field trip to actually go and look at the core of the San Jacinto fault zone right here, you know, in, in here in the mouth of the canyon. So uh, among this group, you have a curious physicist by the name Jay Feinberg standing right here. We are looking at the fault. The fault is, the is in the canyon, in the middle of the canyon here. Uh, and uh, this photos about 20 minutes later, you know, we are here in the wash, still walking, trying to get to the center of the fault, to the core of the fault. So fault zones are very complicated. I will show you. There is a broad image zone, but you can find, especially if you look in canyons, you look, you know, in places that have been exhumed below the surface, there, there is well-defined structures that we are trying to look at in this uh, trip. So here a little bit later, and again, you'll see it better on the sides. In fact, now Jay uh, spends the fault between his two feet. So there is a slip localization zone that is about a few centimeters wide, one to, to three centimeters wide. It's actually, if you keep on going a little bit further, it sticks out of the surface. Uh, it's this surface. And in fact, it, it's right here. And it separates asymmetric structures. There's pulverized rocks on this side. There's damaged rock on that side. And, uh, and, 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 and this, again, this surface is right here in the canyon, surrounded by very complicated damage structure. So we're going to test some predictions using data from the San Jacinto fault zone. And there is some general question that uh, my group is trying to answer. So first, I want to give you the general question and then some sub-questions. So the basic question that guides a lot of the research that we are doing is, do earthquakes have universal properties? that are essentially the same, apart from some statistical fluctuations, as many people believe, or are there some deterministic dependencies uh, on properties of fault zones in the crust, which, if these exist and we understand them, then we can use this to extract more detailed information on earthquake properties. So that's a very general question. And specifically, I hear there are three specific questions that are parts of this general question, and I will not have time to talk about all of these questions. I'll just talk about the first question. Question number one, relations between velocity structure of the fault zone, seismic velocities, in particular existence of bimaterial interfaces in the core of fault zones, and some kind of properties of first structure. Specifically, I'll focus today on rupture earthquake directivity. So we are addressing these questions in the context of the San Jacinto, in part because 
J knows the fault. Actually, this is in part why I selected to show this data and not other data. But there is another reason. It's a very active fault. It's also very complicated, as I'll show you, and it's very well instrumented. So it's instrumented, actually, with hierarchical kind of networks. You have the broad network here. All the triangles are seismometer. The dots are epicenters of earthquakes. So the scale here is 200 kilometers. That's sort of a Southern California scale. Los Angeles is somewhere here. Now, in an inner scale, we have hundreds of instruments here, very close to the fault. And they include linear arrays. I will show you data from all of these scales shortly. Linear arrays that cross the fault at different locations uh, with dense sort of separation, tens of meters between seismometers. And then we have the innermost scale around one of the linear arrays here, SGB, just for one month. These, are, these have been in the field. Some of them are still in the field for five, six, seven years. We are waiting for a big earthquake. We are hesitating taking them out because we actually want to ca capture big earthquake. But, 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 but for one month, around this uh, SGB site, which is shown here with these balloons, we deploy 1,108 sensors in a very tight configuration of 600 meters by 600 meters. So the spacing here is 10 meters. And the trip, the J, the trip that I showed you is just a little bit further here. The, that canyon starts. Okay, So we are essentially right here. Here's the canyon. Okay? And, and so we're going to use this data. And I'm going to test predictions associated with bimaterial ruptures. And you already heard talks about this from Hadar and a bit from Yochai. But I have to summarize what is it that I'm going to test. So let, give, let me give you a very brief overview here, just focusing on the signals that I'm going to test. So actually, the essential physics is really related to asymmetry. Uh, not all asymmetries are the same, Yochai. So some asymmetries are stronger, and the, the contrast of el elastic uh, properties is a very strong asymmetry that has a big effect uh, on, on properties of rupture. So, so starting with Wirtman and going, there are many analytical uh, solutions. There are lots of numerical solutions. Um, the essential physics is that if you put a symmetry across the fault like this, it would produce a symmetry in the opposite along strike direction, a symmetry of the strain field, the dynamic strain field that will be generated when rupture starts propagating. That's essentially the essence in one direction, the direction of motion of the compliance side, there will be dynamic dilation. So it will destabilize. Rupture will propagate happily. This is, that's actually numerical simulation. Uh, these are vectors that show uh, particle velocity. So in this direction, you get increasing dilation because of this asymmetry in the motion normal to the fault. In the opposite direction, there will be compression, so it will destabilize. Fault, and this is shown in a very old animation. It used to be a good animation 20 years ago. You'll see it better on the side there. And what you see, in, this is numerical simulation. These fields are extracted from one such simulation. So we initiate rupture symmetrically. It's, there is a bimaterial here. We have artificial nucleation that, that forces rupture to propagate symmetrically in a, in a small zone. But then the dynamic strain field uh, evolve as they do. And, and you see that spontaneously, we get rupture continues to propagate happily in one direction. It gets arrested in the other direction. So the prediction that we get from this, and we're going to test uh, these predictions with field data. That's the essence of the talk. The prediction is that if I identify a bimaterial interface, and I know the velocity structure, uh, and I know the loading, the sense of loading, I have some sort of prediction for, for rupture direction. So we're going to have to go and image the velocity structure, and then we have to go and look at rupture directions. This is uh, one prediction. Now, to test this prediction, we need to test any prediction. I need lots of data. So, so this prediction can be tested only with ruptures of small events because uh, in the instrumental period that is just a few tens of years, we didn't have a single large earthquake on the San Jacinto. There are other faults that had one single earthquake. So essentially, we don't have data to measure directivity, which is what I want to look at, using large, earthqu using large earthquakes. So I'm going to look at directivity with small earthquakes. But of course, the large earthquakes are more interesting. And I want also to have some sort of prediction to test with the larger sex. So for this, I need to look at the long-term signatures in form of rock damage that large earthquakes would put on the fault. So this signature, I can go to the fault and, and ask myself, what, do the, what did the rupture in the last 100,000 years do? Now I have many large earthquakes. So to answer this, to get a theoretical prediction, we look at simulation of off-fault plastic yielding in dynamic rupture uh, calculation. This is numerical calculation by Joe Andrews. So this is homogeneous solid, and the colors show inelastic strain, intensity of inelastic strain. 
So the rupture nucleated here, it propagates symmetrically. This is a symmetric problem. You get off-fault inelastic yielding in a triangular shape that continues to grow because this is crack-like rupture. So the stress intensity factor grows with propagation distance. And this is what you get from one event, only one event with epicenter right here. Now imagine you have 10,000 of this and you just keep on moving the center all around the plot and you superpose this, you will just get symmetric strip of damage, which is what you would expect. Nothing here breaks the symmetry. On the other hand, if I go to the bimaterial problem, I showed you that for ranges of condition, it evolved to preferred direction, unidirectional. And so from one earthquake, this is what we get. First of all, it's not propagating in this numerical simulation as a crack, it's a pulse. So you see the weeds fluctuate, but it's more or less constant, wi constant weeds. And now damage, uh, if I have uh, epicenters in, addition, in, in random positions here, and I keep on having statistical preferred prediction to this direction, I will keep on getting damage only on this side. Damage, by the way, is generated in the tensional quadrants. So when the rupture starts propagating, these quadrants are compressional, these quadrants are, are tensional. That's why we get here anti-symmetric damage on both tensional quadrants. But here the rupture propagates only in one direction. I have only one tensional quadrant, so there's damage only on one side. So I have another prediction now. The prediction associated with now many large earthquakes is that I'm expecting asymmetric shallow rock damage across the fault, and it occurs on the side that, has, <coughs> that is stiffer, higher seismic velocities at depths. Okay, so this damage is preferentially generated in the shallow crust, it, it gets shuts off when we get uh, to, uh, to the deeper part of the fault. The energy, the strain energy across the two blocks at depths control actually the rupture properties. And, and so, so that's sort of our prediction. So in summary, I have several predictions here. I won't be able to test all of them, show you the results. But we're going to need to test using seismology to actually image bimaterial interfaces in fault zones. We will also use seismology to image damage zones, properties of the damage zone. This also can be done geology, and it has been done. I just don't have time to show you all of this. And then we will also use seismology to look at earthquake directivities. We're going to go to small earthquakes and, and, and switch and look also on directivities. Okay? That's the program now for the observational part, which is the bulk of my talk. And of course, this can be tested also in the lab, and I'm very grateful uh, to Jay and Hadar and everybody else in the group here that actually invest their time in, in doing careful experiments on these are quite difficult because of the instabilities, etc. Okay, so we're going to do now, we're going to look at multi-scale signal structural imaging first to identify where do we have bimaterial interfaces in the San Jacinto fault zone and what's the sense of the contrast it's complicated a bit, and then we will look at earthquake properties. So I'm going to start with, the, with a large scale, and then we're going to go in. Uh, I told you fault zones are complicated. We're going to look at regional scale, and then we're going to go in there uh, all the way to the scale of this interface that you saw Jay standing on. So the larger scale is uh, uh, these figures uh, illustrate velocity structure on a large scale. Uh, essentially, we are imaging this entire box here. Uh, it's center, it is centered on the, on the uh, San Jacinto, and these, these colors show P wave velocity, VP. Red are low velocity, blue are fast velocities. The figures here on the left show velocities in, two, in three horizontal cross sections. So this is three kilometers. That's a horizontal slice across this whole region at three kilometers, five and seven. This figures on the right show vertical cross sections that cross the entire fault system in different positions. So for example, profile six here crosses <coughs> this whole fault system from the southwest to the northeast here. About 10% would be a typical contrast. So we'll see, we will, we will have a more refined results on the actual value of the contrast. Remember, this is a large scale. So the resolution here is just one to two kilometers. In fact, we don't know if we have an interface in this resolution. It could be smeared. But what we see, we do see contrast. You see it very clearly. So here's the San Jacinto. It's coordinate zero. So you see here it separates blue. Sorry. Yeah, so we see clear contrast is my point. But I want to describe the contrast in some detail because it will be important for our test. So, so here, let's look at this figure, which is horizontal cross-section. 
the, in this entire section that we call, I'll call it the central <coughs> portion of the fault, you'll see that the north side has faster velocity than the, than the south side. You see this is blue and this is yellowish. But when you cross this position, particular location that is called San Jacinto Basin, it flips. So, so this is about 50 kilometers. We have a 50 kilometer section with a certain polarity of the contrast. Uh, and, and from this location toward the junction with the San Andreas Fault, the polarity flips. This is good. So we have a complicated situation here. I'm expecting not just directivity. I'm expecting, in fact, that on this section, rupture would propagate to the left, to the north, uh, north east, and on this section in the opposite direction. We're going to test it a little bit later. You see the contrast here also very clearly, plus damage zones. Here's the damage zone, kind of fall of slouch. It gets narrower with depths and eventually it gets very localized. We don't see it in this resolution. And you see clear contrast. And again, if you go up the profile, you find that it flips. So this is kind of rough, low resolution. And I'm going next to show you inner scale, finer resolution. But again, I'm, I'm, I, I want to emphasize we have contrasts. We don't know on this resolution if it's sharp, if we have an interface, or just smeared blobs. But we see reversal in the polarities, which is, which is important. It's going to give us a, a sort of, it's not a simple situation. So we have, we have more refined, better ground to test actually the data. OK, so to look at the inner part of the damage and interfaces, I'm using now waves that are propagating actually exclusively along bimaterial interfaces and also in the damage zone. So if you have a contrast like this, there is going to be a wave if you are on the slow side of the fault closer to the fault than a particular critical distance. There's a simple formula for this. It depends on the velocity contrast and the propagation distance along the fault. The first arrival is not the body wave that propagates within the volume, but it's a wave that refracts along the interface, actually being dragged by the velocity on the fast side, which is here. And then from the interface, it leaks onto the slower side. And we know how to recognize this wave. It has very, I'll show you some a little bit later. OK, so, so I'm going to look in the, in the center of the fall zone. Within all of this, I have the tomography. We're going to look inside and see if we can find these waves. Now, if I add a layer, a damage layer, low velocity zone, I showed you here that we see low velocity zone. We have hints that there are contrasts. So I'm just going to try to refine the observation. If I add a layer on top of this, close to the layer, I'm getting wave, gu guided waves, actually, resonance mode. If the layer is simple enough, uniform enough, we're going to look for this as well. It will help us defining the inner part of the, of the damage. And remember, I want to see the damage because I'm going to look to see if it's symmetric with respect to the surface trace or not, uh, once I find bimaterial interfaces as well. OK, so this illustrates uh, very quickly. This is old stuff. This is P wave. These are 3D numerical simulation. Find a difference. P wave, S wave. This is a low velocity zone. You see you start developing this resonance mode on, on, on seismograms. Uh, the low velocity zones like, look like this. So I'm now going to try, this is, this is our lower, I'm focusing now on the, on the site where we had the 1108 sensor, the spec box array. And this is the large scale tomography that we got in this paper. We know it's fast on this side, it's slow on that side. This is average over the entire seismogenic zone. Uh, and, and this is how it looks at the surface. So, so the first question here is to actually find out where is the fault at depth. It's not obvious. If you look at geological map, you find, and this is a geological map, you find lots of traces. You see, here is one trace, here is another trace, etc. And this is just at a limited resolution. If I increase the resolution, there will be more traces. So we are asking, where is a, a, an interface, a depth, that actually separates two different blocks? We know that in the shallow part, it's very, very complicated. So having this kind of data, we can answer this rather easily. All I have to do is plot seismogram waveforms along lines, lines that cross the fault. This is roughly the fault zone, right? I want to find the location of the fault. So these are waveforms, and they contain both <coughs> wiggles and fluctuations. <laughs> wiggles, wiggles are actually phases that we can model deterministically. I'll show you. Fluctuation is everything else, uh, right? And so what you see here, you don't have to be a seismologist to see that when you cross a particular position, in fact, it's indicated in, the, in red here, the character of the waveforms change significantly. So these are waveforms, again, in, in a line across the fault generated, in this case, by four earthquakes. But we look at hundreds of earthquakes. We looked. And we always see that when you cross this line, there's a significant change in the character of the waveforms. So we identify this. This is just in this line. So we walk 
on different lines, and we can actually map the location of of a deep interface. That when you cross when you cross it, the character of the waveform change. That's the seismogenic fault. So in this case, it's roughly coinciding with this surface trace, and the rest actually part of the damage zone. I will demonstrate this. Okay. In fact, if you look at these wave packets, these are trapped waves. This you see amplification of uh, seismogram waveforms. And they're amplified because the, 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 there is a damage zone with lower elastic modular. So the waves come to, to these zones with reduced elastic uh, modular, and they get amplified. <coughs> so I want to I move forward. I want to show you more results. I, uh, and so, so this is a, a sketch summary. We know we have, we have this. This is fast. This is slow on large scale from the tomography. But actually, when I look carefully inside, we find that this side, that is nominally fast, contain a zone that is slower locally. In other words, we have damaged structure that is on the stiff side of the fault. And this kind of structure can be generated. I cannot prove that it had been. But it can be generated by many big ruptures propagating, in this case, to the northwest. That's, that would be the theoretical prediction. They will, pr will produce more damage on the stiff side at shallow depths. So let's say. Uh, let, let's go on and, and move to another site now. So we were here, SGB. I'm going to just show you quickly some results from here, some results from here, and then we're going to look at earthquake directivities. So we are here in the southernmost part. This is beyond the, the field trip was here, the canyon. Now we are further to the south. We have another array. You see it on the Google map. This is the surface trace, the main surface trace in the geological map. And there are lots of little ones. We record and model lots of resonance mode, trapped waves. So this is an example of modeling the trapped wave. We use this very simple solution. We have an analytical solution. We put it in a genetic inversion algorithm. It keeps on perturbing parameters. We get probability distribution function of the parameters. There are clear peaks. You see the fits. These are the parameters, the best fitting parameters. And, and by doing additional analysis that I don't have time to explain right now, we conclude that the main fault is right here. Okay, so here is a situation that almost all the faults made by the geologists are actually in the damaged structure. So again, we have asymmetric structure. It's on the, again, on the side that is fast, the depths. It's again consistent with, with this prediction. The rupture here is like to propagate to the northwest. That's, that's, that, that's uh, what, what we get from the large scale uh, uh, asymmetry and also the, the local asymmetry, which is reversed. So the last sort of velocity structure I will show you comes from the array on the other side. So now I jump to the north, north west part. Here's an array with about 100 seismometers. This is the main trace of the fault as mapped by geologists. And in fact, the geologists in the room here can identify the damaged rocks. They are the whitish rocks right here. So you see, right? Yeah. Yeah, LA is right here, yeah, somewhere here. San Diego is somewhere here. And this line is the border between the US and Mexico. OK, we, we are sort of focused on this region. This is the Salton Trough, Salton Sea. Palm Spring is somewhere here. OK, so we are, we are kind of, these, these ruptures on this fault will affect Los Angeles, LA, and Riverside. Riverside is right here, another large. 100 kilometer inward from San Diego, about 100 kilometer, actually, Riverside is right here along the fault. So, so all my conclusion, the rupture here like to propagate to the northwest is bad news for Riverside. It's good news for San Diego. It's OK news from Los Angeles. So, so here is, the, here is the, the, this last array that I want to show you very quickly. You already, we are using similar methodology. We plot all the seismograms. There are lots of wiggles here, actually, that we can model. There are also some fluctuations. Actually, we model also the fluctuations using techniques dealing with the ambient noise. So we see, what we see is that in this region right here, we again have these pockets of amplified motion that are trapped waves. We can model them very well with the solution. We can get the parameters. It's asymmetric with respect to the fault. And it's all, again, on the, <coughs> on the same side. Now, in this case, I'm skipping details. We actually conclude that the deep interface, there is a bimaterial interface here. I'll show, show it to you in, uh, shortly. I'll show you head waves. But it's, in fact, coincide with the surface trace of the fault. 
So here there's really one major fault. The geologists did a good job. In some of the other places, there are lots of traces. It's a bit more complicated. So this is the illustration of head waves now. Uh, these are sets of seismograms generated by all, by, by, by all the circles that are red here. Okay? So, so these are, this is a vertical cross-section. You can see the depth. But we are looking back 50 kilometers now, from that location back 50 kilometers to the southwest. And, and we see clear interface waves. We have very clear predictions here. There is, a, there is a, it may look noisy to you, but this is a P wave. That's the P body wave. And this is a head wave, the first arrival. And the time separation between the head wave and the P wave increase systematically following this very simple formula. From this formula, I can get the average velocity contrast across the fault. Iran asked me before, it's 10% from the slope. Okay, and that is an interface, th this interface is deep. It goes sort of all the way down to 15 kilometers, right? <coughs> and there is damage asymmetry again. To, to, to one side, the side that is uh, faster velocity at, at, at depths. So we're concluding again, all of these damage asymmetry are all consistent in all of these places. Rupture likes to propagate it to the northwest. So this is all about damage structure. What about earthquake directivities themselves? So I told you, unfortunately, we don't have data for large earthquakes. It would be much easier. We have to go to small earthquakes. It's a bit tricky. And uh, what we do, we do the best we can. So this is a work, actually, by Itai Corazon that uh, was here earlier. And we are actually measuring directivity of earthquake rupture or, or signatures of directivity. So if rupture propagates in one direction, or if there is a symmetric rupture, and mostly rupture propagates in one direction, there is a Doppler-like effect that leads to larger amplitude and shorter duration in the direction of rupture propagation. This is why that direction is bad for Riverside, because the amplitude, the amplification of motion can, can be factor five or more, actually. Uh, okay, and in the opposite direction, you get lower amplitude. So we don't see this very well. This is an example of measuring amplitude in different directions. Uh, but but you, see, you can see clearly that the, the amplitudes are not the same. Part of the changes in the amplitude have to do with the structure, nothing to do with the directivity. So you have to do this for many earthquakes. But when you do this for many earthquakes, as Itai did, this, this is a map of directivities associated with, I don't know, maybe 1,000 earthquakes, small earthquakes. So what do you see? It's interesting. This is, this is the fault. This is the canyon again, where the field trip was. And we, we, had, we had here, all, all of this section has clear velocity contrast, but then it flips, as you remember. Okay, so, so what we see, we see in this part, there is a cluster of earthquakes that have, there are two families. There is one family that tends to propagate to the northwest, which is exactly what we would predict for this section and would be consistent with the damage concentrated on that side of the fault, right? We have another family, I'll get to this shortly, that is actually perpendicular. This is real. There is another structure here. I I'll talk about this in a second. But if when you come to this side, and in this side, the velocity contrast flips, right? So here, these earthquakes are on that section of the fault. This is the preferred propagation direction. We jump to the other side. We cross the San Jacinto Basin. Now the sense of the velocity contrast flip, and we see that there is a preferred direction. Most of the arrows now go in the opposite direction. So this is consistent. What about that, Th this sort of strange family? So it turns out the structure is, of course, very complicated. This shows you aftershocks of one earthquake, mid-sized earthquake, actually, this event, I think, magnitude only 5.2. And these are 20,000 aftershocks, map view of 20,000 aftershocks. Some of them are aligned along the fault. There are clear lineations normal to the fault as well, okay? So these earthquakes, they're all small. These are all small earthquakes. So these earthquakes actually represent the family that are associated with these structures. We also know, uh, if you look at data carefully, the last 30, 40 years, we know that all the earthquakes, larger than four, are in fact sitting on the main fault, okay? So the big earthquakes are on that main fault. They are going to propagate in this direction. These events are associated with these core structures, which is just part of geology. <coughs> it's a very complicated structure. And, and they, are, they are propagating, you know, in that direction. So this is uh, one more slide, the last slide I have on data. So this is a more complicated technique, more refined technique to look at rupture directivity as associated with second seismic moments. So in this technique, this, 
what we are getting is space and time derivatives of the seismic moment, which gives us a drift, average drift of the centroid of the seismic moment, and the arrows pointing to the direction of this average drift of the seismic moment. And you see again that in this side, where we had, uh, where, where, uh, where this was fast and this was slow, the preferred propagation direction is in this direction. The arrows point to the north. We come here, the arrow flips. We also have a few coarse structure as well. This technique is more complicated, more demanding. Therefore, there are data here only of 17 earthquakes. This is work in progress. We are trying to add earthquakes to this. So in conclusions, the key question, overall question was, are there some deterministic variations related to properties and fall zone of the, of the crust that can help us, for example, refining estimates of seismic shaking hazard? In this case, by making a statistical statement that large earthquakes would tend to propagate in a certain direction. That gives a very uh, asymmetric distribution of shaking. So, so for this, and this question, there, are, there were sub-questions here. For this question, relation be between velocity, structure, and earthquake activity, the answer was yes. Statistically, I showed you that there are fluctuations, but statistically, there is definitely a bias. This is not a sort of uniform distribution. We see this is what we see. Now, there were other questions there. And that's the second half. I right? This is the second 60 years. So, so Jay worked on this. Uh, Jay and Hadar and other people. This is great. Another very important question is, uh, it turns out theoretical results, analytical results, show that if you break material, so you reduce actually the elastic modular during the rupture propagation, there is an extra form of radiation that generated dynamically during the propagation of rupture with some unusual properties. Among, it's, it, has, it's, it is associated with high frequency and isotopic P waves that are going to produce sort of dynamic shaking. And I think this is a theoretical prediction. We don't know if it is uh, correct. Uh, we are actually trying, my group is trying to test this with seismological data. As you see, it's very complicated. We are far away from the sources, etc. So I believe that testing this in the laboratory can have very significant impact on earthquake source seismology if these kind of extra waves within the rupture zones will be found. And this is, of course, a very difficult problem, but Jay can do it. So I'll stop here and answer